Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Good morning, everyone. Excited uh, again for another, another beautiful Sunday. I love summer. I get to, to, to enjoy a warm weather. And uh, I know it's, you know, a little challenging right now as we think about our friends in Jasper and kind of in BC and in Alberta that are experiencing fires just even across North America. I know it's kind of been this, this season that always seems to come up every year, every summer. We have times where we are praying for, for rain. And, you know, we we're blessed this week. We got some rain this week. So I'm enjoying a little bit of some clearer weather. But I'm Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here at Known Church. And it's an honor you're with us. Uh, this morning, and if you've missed the past few weeks, or you, this is maybe your first time uh, here, we've been going through a, a series uh, this summer called uh, Questions God Asks Us, and we're going through some of the questions throughout Scripture that God asks of His people, and we've gone through several of them already, we're going to continue this series all the way uh, through the summer, and I've been really enjoying it. And the next question we're going to go through today is this question is, what is your name? What is your name? And there's so much importance in a name. And I don't know if you've ever done maybe even some research on your name, what your name means, but I'm going to tell you what my name means. And I've told you this before, but my name, Dustin, means valiant warrior. Do you know what this means? It means I'm tough. If you know me, you're like, I don't know about that. You know? <laughs> but my name means valiant warrior. And my middle name, my middle name is Bradley, and, and my, which Bradley means broad meadow, which when I think of broad meadow, you know what I think of? Peace. I just think of like a pasture where I can go and settle down. But I can tell you right now that oftentimes my home does not feel like a broad meadow. Sometimes it feels like a battlefield, right? There's literally stuff on the ground I'm trying to avoid so I don't step on a piece of Lego and hurt my foot for three weeks. You know what I mean? Like, like, like sometimes that's what it feels like. And then my last name, which is Bennett, means blessed. And so this means that I am blessed. So if I were to look at my name, it's kind of like this. I'm a blessed warrior of the broad meadow, right? I don't know if that's actually, if you want to put it together, it means I'm tough, peaceful, and blessed. That's what I would view my name. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful name. What's so funny is before I was born, my dad wanted to call me Zacchaeus. Like full on, my name was going to be Zacchaeus. And one thing I know about that is I'd be a lot shorter right now if my name was Zacchaeus. Right? I'd be a lot shorter. I'd be a wee little man if my name was Zacchaeus. But... If we look at names in general, our names, which are given to us by our parents, um, there's, there's importance in names. You know, when we named our children, we wanted to pick names of significance, of history, and uh, uh, people we honor and love. And so we chose our names in remembrance of people we loved. And we looked at what they meant and we picked the names for our children and we picked names of people we love and admire and people that inspire us and people that have impacted our lives greatly. And, and I think we all, when we look at names, the value that names bring. And as important as names are now, if we go through history, names have always carried heavy significance. In fact, the names of people, especially if we look throughout Scripture, people's names often portrayed their character or their origin of how they came to be and what their story is. And, and how many times do we see throughout Scripture God changing somebody's name and, and then them kind of going away from an old identity into a new identity of what they were going to do in the future. You know, some of the names you might know of is Moses. And Moses means, means drawn out. And if you know the story, Pharaoh's daughter picked him up or drew him out of the water and she, she gave him the name Moses. You know, if you look at Esau, his name literally means Harry, not H-A-R-R-Y, but H-A-I-R-Y, Harry. Imagine if that's what your name meant. Your name, you're, you're, you, you know, your mom gives birth, she's like, ah, oh, you're so hairy. Your name's Esau, you know? Like, that's kind of the power or importance of names. 
And God changes uh, Abram's name to Abraham. And Abram means exalted father, but Abraham means father of nations. And when God looks at names, it, it, there's power in names. Nair, names carry power and they carry significance. They can speak of who we are and what we do. If you look at the history of names, it's fascinating. So the next question God asks us, which is, what is your name, comes in the story of Genesis chapter 32. And a little bit of context is Jacob is about to go see his brother Esau or Harry. And he sent gifts to his brother. He isn't sure what's going to happen. He's a little nervous. He's a little scared of what it could look like. He's afraid of the reaction his brother will have. So if you read chapter 31, you kind of get in 32, you get a little bit more context into this story, but we can pick up the story, Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. This is when Jacob wrestles with God. It says, during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two servant wives and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And I love this part of the story. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. Like out of nowhere, right? He sends everything across. All of a sudden a man shows up and they're wrestling until dawn. That's a long wrestling match. And when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not go unless you bless me. And the first thing out of, the, out of his mouth, of this angel's mouth, is, what is your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. And he said this, your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told them, from now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and you have won. This is a powerful, powerful story. But the question that comes in the middle of the story when he says, hey, I'm not leaving. I'm not letting you go until I get a blessing. The question is, what is your name? And a question that God knew the answer to. It wasn't like it blew God's mind. Like, oh, wait, what is your name? Right? God knew what his name was. None of these questions that we're going through were asked because of an actual inquiry from God being like, uh-oh, I'm kind of confused. He knows the answer. But he asks these questions because they carry a much deeper meaning and significance. When God asks Jacob here in this moment, what is your name? He is asking a much deeper question, which I think is, who are you? Who are you? He says, I'm Jacob. Now, if you know the history of the word Jacob, it means some subplanter or swindler. And a subplanter is someone who takes the place of someone else or takes the place of someone who was there first. And if you know the story of Jacob, that was his identity. He was a trickster. He, he, he was a swindler. He'd always, you know, take things that didn't actually belong to him. He took the birthright. He traded with his brother who was coming back and he was hungry. And he says, give me the birthright and I'll give you some stew. And he's like, that sounds like a great idea. Old Harry thought that was the best idea. I'm going to get some soup and give up my birthright. And then, then, then later on, he, he tricks his father into giving him the blessing. It says he kind of disguised himself as his brother while his dad was in his old age, couldn't see, and goes kind of, you know, near the end of his life. And he gets the blessing that belonged to his brother. So no wonder when, when, he see, when he's about to meet his brother, he's a little nervous. He's stolen everything from his brother. But he says, I'm Jacob. I'm a trickster. I'm a swindler. That's who I am. His name is fully represented in who he was in his past. That's who he was, a trickster. There wasn't a name that didn't carry any meaning. It, it carried meaning. When he said it, he was saying who he was. Not just his name, but his identity. It spoke to the character he had. And then he says he wrestles with an angel or wrestles with this man and says, I'm not leaving here until I get a blessing. I think sometimes in life when we're, you know, praying to God, we're like, God, I'm not leaving until you give me what I'm asking for, right? Now, Jacob literally was wrestling. 
And he says, I'm not leaving till you give me a blessing. And what was the blessing? It was a new name or a new identity, a new character, a new creation, a new name to match his new character. See, when we come to Christ, we become a new creation. Jacob's name changed because his character changed. See, a name change is an outward sign of an inward change. If you look throughout scripture when people's names were changed, it's because there was an inward change happening and they were getting set up or prepared to be and live out the calling they were called to live. Throughout scripture, you read moment after moment after moment. And maybe God is asking you today or he's asking me today, what is your name? Or maybe another way that we can ask this question is, who are you? Who am I? It's a great question that I think throughout life we try and figure out, who am I? You know, when we're little kids, it's always like, what do you, I want to be when I grow up, right? And it's always heroic jobs. It's like, I'm going to be a firefighter. Or I'm going to be in the military or I'm going to be a nurse. You know, all these heroic jobs. And I think it shows that young ages, we want to live lives filled with purpose. We want to live lives where we make an impact, where we actually are, have significant lives that, that are filled with purpose and we're doing what God has called us to do. But I think sometimes we get so caught up as when we're even from young ages of children that it's what we do for a living that defines who we are or who we were that defines who we are today. I think God is asking us, who are you? In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person or a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has become. See, when we belong to Christ, we become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. God makes us new. See, our past, our past ideologies or our past lives or our past sin or our past mistakes or our past temptations, we think that that defines who we are today. But we need to realize that God is putting away with those things and making us new. When he says, who are you? What is your name? We can say, I'm the child of God. We know who we are. God makes us new. He's saying maybe you used to be a swindler. Maybe you used to be a trickster. But now you are a prince with God. You maybe stole the birthright. Maybe you stole the blessing. Maybe you tricked your father. Maybe you tricked your brother. But no longer do I call you Jacob. I call you Israel. Here is your new name. Here is your new identity. And when we come to Christ, when we give him our life, when we trust him with our life, what happens is we become new. It actually says it changes. He changes the way we think. He changes the way we act. He changes how we live. He teaches us how to live a life that is full of light and full of salt. That we're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. You are a new creation. We put our past in his hands. He builds us a beautiful future. See, maybe God is asking you the same question today. What is your name? Who are you? And I think even from when we were little kids to even who we are today, this is a question that still rattles around in our minds. This tension between who we were and who we want to be. This tension between what our dreams were and where we're living now. We're like, God, there's got to be more. We struggle with who we are. I think one of the biggest things facing us here in North America right now is insecurity. I think one of the biggest things facing us here, especially even for the next generation, is the struggle that's going on in our minds. We think about how the, the crisis we have with mental health and trauma and fear and all the things that are going on inside of us and we're struggling and we don't know who we are. 
There's this identity crisis our world is facing. We're trying to figure out, who am I? We're trying to figure out, who, who am I? Why am I here? What am I here to do? And we're going through it, and we're, and we're seeing this over and over and over again. People trying all sorts of things to try and figure out who they are. But if we go to the source, that's where we actually find the answer. And some of us are like, God, I'm not hearing you speak identity. You're asking me, who am I? You're asking me, what is your name? And I'm not, I don't know. You're like, I, I don't know who I am. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to learn who I am. I don't even know who I am. And it's a question that we get a lot of answers from. Who am I? You might look at your life and you might see, well, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a man. I'm a son. I'm an uncle. In fact, my daughter Jane, for the longest time, I'd say, Jane, what's my name? She'd be like, you're Uncle D, you know. <laughs> For the longest time, she'd call me Uncle D. Uh, she'd even say, like, her, when her friends were over, she'd be like, hey, why don't we go ask Uncle D? You know, and then she'd call me that. I thought it was so cute. And then she started calling me Dustin sometimes. I just think it's cute. I don't really get mad. I think it's cute. But, but I'm a brother. I'm Canadian. I'm a Burton. I'm an Edmontonian now. I used to be a Calgarian, but now I'm an Edmontonian. That's who I am. This is part of my identity, but in fact, these, part, these small things make up who I am, but included in who we are has to be that we are children of God. I think sometimes we get our identity in our circumstances or the things we see, but we need to realize that sometimes our identity doesn't come through what we see or where we live or the titles we have on earth. It comes from who created us. Who are you? What is your name? Do you see who you are naturally? Do you see the beautiful parts? Do you see the challenging parts? But more importantly, do you see your new identity? I think too many of us, we only see who we are in our natural birth. What do we see? We see our flaws, we see our fears. We see our failures and we just see it in this mixing pot of brokenness and insecurity and fear that kind of rattles around and we're like, that's who I am. But we need to learn to open our eyes and see who we are in our spiritual birth. See, God is in the business of changing names. God is in the business of changing lives, of creating new futures and Letting, helping us let go of the past to step into the new and step into the future. We need to see who we are in our spiritual birth. But I think sometimes we don't know because we don't spend enough time reading the scriptures. We don't know who God says we are. So of course the voices that are loudest are the ones on social media of course, the voice that's the loudest is what people have told us all of our lives because we're not turning up the volume on the true, real, loving voice of God. And we wonder why we're struggling when we're not even spending time with the one who calls us by name. We wonder why we're struggling. We wonder why. And it's like, we got to learn who we are. I have a list for us. This is a really long list. I printed off some copies of this list. I'm not going to go through all of them because it'll take me probably 35 minutes. But do you know what the Bible says about you? You know what it says? It says you're a child of God. It says you're a friend of Jesus. It says you're no longer a slave but a son and daughter. It says that you've been adopted by God as a son and daughter. And then again, it says, I am a son and daughter of God, and he is my father. It says, I am an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. I am united with the Lord, and I am one in spirit with him. I am saved by grace through faith and not by works. I have nothing to boast about before God. So I have peace with God, and I am reconciled to him. I am loved by Jesus and freed from my sins by his blood. I have been forgiven of all my sin. I have been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. 
He says, I am free forever. I'm never left alone or forsaken. I've been established, anointed, and sealed by God. I have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of Jesus. God, God's divine power has given me everything I need for a godly life. I could go on and on and on and on and on about who God says we are, but sometimes we don't know because we don't open the source and we don't spend enough time with the one who's going to speak life into us. We spend too long trying to figure it out on our own. We spend too long. We start to believe the lies the enemy is trying to speak. But in Philippians 1, 6, I am confident that the work of God started in me, he will see through to completion. Again, I could read moment after moment throughout scripture where God tells us who we are and how we can be strong and courageous. We can be confident that we're loved and accepted by him. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm the salt of the earth. I'm the light of the world. Moment after moment of God, who God says we are. And I find it so unfortunate. So many people I know, they go to church and they don't know who they are. They don't know how loved they are. We get so caught up in what we've done. We get so caught up in our past and we forget that there's still our future ahead of us. Who are you? What is your name? We got to learn who we are by reading and understanding what God has already said. I think sometimes we're waiting for an answer. We're like, God, who am I? He's like, I already told you. You're like, God, but what about now? He's like, I already spoke it though. I open our Bibles. Now God will speak to us, Absolutely. But if we want to start somewhere to hear his voice, go to what he's already said so we can actually know when it's his voice that we're hearing. We got to know his character. We got to know who he is. We got to know what he says about us, what is already written. Why do we need to spend time with Jesus on the daily? One of the reasons is that we can know who we are. We can know what our name is. We can learn how God views us and we can learn how God sees us and we can learn what God calls us. You know why? Because it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget when somebody says something about us or calls us out on something. We forget who we are. One day Jesus was asked, why his disciples didn't fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees? They asked, why? This was his response, Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples? And the Pharisees do, why? And Jesus is always telling stories. He said, Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast when, while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine in the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. 
What he's saying is there's going to be a time for feasting and there's going to be a time for fasting. And one thing you know about Jesus and his disciples, they love to eat. Every other story, they're eating a meal. Every other story, they're, they're cooking food and they're eating together and they're celebrating and they're celebrating the traditional feasts of their culture and they were together. And Jesus is saying, there's going to be a time when I'm gone and these guys are going to need to fast. There's going to be a time where I'm gone and it says they, right, they go to the upper room, they're scared, Jesus is gone. Like, I don't know what to do. They start praying. And God shows up. But at the end, he talks about wineskins. He says, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. Because when, when the wine expands, when it, when it starts to cre- go, the wine skids, which have already lost their c- capacity to hold new wine, they're going to burst. And they wouldn't be able to expand with the wine. They're going to burst. What he's saying here is that old expectations that are brought on by some of the religious leaders that weren't even part of, uh, uh, of the scriptures. They were just part of more history and culture. I think Jesus' ministry taught us that sometimes we have to change our expectations. And we have to expect the new. Because the new's coming. He's saying new wine. New expectations. New ideas. New thoughts. And Jesus was bringing all this new, but this funny is that a lot of what Jesus was teaching wasn't actually new. They had just lost sight of what actually was true in the beginning. It became more cultural and came more, more, more just a part of their heritage than it actually was what it was supposed to be in the beginning. The new needs new containers. The new he had for Jacob required a new name. His character had to change and his identity had to change. And our identity when we're in Christ is him, is Christ. Because outside of him, you know what's going to happen? And we know this. You know what's going to happen? We're going to see fear come. We're going to see insecurity We're going to see all our inadequacies. We're going to see how unqualified we are. We're going to see how broken we are. We're going to see that our past were swindlers and tricksters. See, our future can and will be different than our past. If we allow His love and forgiveness to wash us clean and make us whole and make us new. You know, our takeaway today is this. What is your name? Do you know who you are? Do you know who the Bible says you are? Who are you? See, we need to stop believing the lies the enemy tells us. Do you want to know why? Because he's a pretty bad source for truth. You want to know why? The Bible says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And some of us, that's the voice we're believing. We think on the enemy tells us that's just who we are. He's a bad source. See, the Bible clearly tells us who we are. And let's believe what God says about us, what the Bible says about us, and not the lies the enemy is speaking to us. Not what people have spoken over us in the past, because that's not who we are. I think I've told you this story before, but when I was younger, I truly believed I was stupid. Because of how I was spoken to while I was in school. I struggled in school. I didn't ever do super well. In fact, I was really horrible at writing. I wasn't really good at kind of, you know, writing essays. I always struggled. You know, I'd get out of my diploma in 12th grade, my English diploma. And they're like, what source did you use for your diploma? I'm like, well, this one. They're like, that's a bad idea. I'm like, thanks, you know. I always struggled. 
and I'm not joking, for a long time, even sometimes to this day, I start to believe the, that, that fact that, that I'm not smart. I start, I start to believe it. But then I need to realize that God has made me a new creation. It doesn't matter what the past says. It matters what God says. It doesn't matter what they said to me all those years ago. It matters what God is saying to me today. Do you know who you are? Do you know the inheritance you get when you give your life to Jesus? Do you know what you have? I think sometimes we feel like we've been adopted into this beautiful family, you know, the church. But we don't actually know the inheritance we already have. We don't know what we actually carry. We don't know what we get when we give our lives to Jesus. We don't even know what we fully get. You got to read the scriptures to know. There's so many things. I just want to encourage you. I know some of us, we've had things spoken over us. So we're believing lies about who we are. I want to encourage you, just like God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. God always would strengthen his people before they'd go into battle. He'd always strengthen his people and give them what they needed. And sometimes it's a little odd, like walking around a wall seven times and blowing some trumpets. Sometimes there's a little, uh, the plan was a little odd. We're like, God, can you give me a plan where it doesn't require much work and it's not going to make me look a little crazy? He's like, ah, probably not. You're going to look a little silly sometimes. But I'd rather look silly for Jesus. I'd rather say things and tell people I love them on the streets. It might seem a little odd. But when I know who I am, I can be confident enough to share that same identity with every single person I see. See, when we know who we are, we can go around confident because we know that the one is fighting with us. I remember being so scared for parent-teacher interviews as a kid. Now, I know I'm probably going to be almost the same nervous when my kids are going to parent-teacher interviews with me. I'd be so nervous about what they would say, but I remember walking in with my dad and be like, I'm confident now, you know. My dad's going to fight for me. And that's what he did. When teachers would say stuff to me, he would say, that's not who you are. It's not who you are. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, that's not who you are. Your past is not who you are. The mistakes you made, the sin in your life, the failures, that's not who you are. See, Jacob may have, you know, played some tricks. But God said, you're not a trickster. You're a prince of God. You're Israel. How many of y'all know that name Israel? That's a powerful name even to this day, right? It's a big name. It means a little bit more than valiant warrior, you know. <laughs> Broad meadow. Do you know who you are? Do you know? What is your name? I think that's a question God is asking us and asking our church is, who are you? And not even just who are you, it's who are you going to be? Who are we going to be when the darkness keeps getting darker? Who are we going to be when we have to make decisions and stand up? Who are we going to be? Who are we going to be when fear comes and we don't know what to do? Who are we going to be? I want to be one who's willing to wrestle with God all night. And I might even have to walk with a limb for the rest of my life. I'll do it. Let's believe what the Bible says and not the lies of the enemy. I just want to pray for us and pray for identity and pray for strength and pray for courage because I think we need it. I think we need to know who we are. God, we come before you today as a church and as individuals. And God, I pray that you speak to us who we are. God, I pray that every lie 
that we're believing about who we are, God, I pray that we learn the scripture that combats that lie. We learn who we are. We learn who you called us to be. We learn to be strong and courageous. We learn to fight. God, I pray that as things get happening in our world, that God, I pray that we as a church, we as followers of you, we will be strong. And we know who we need to be. To stand up for truth. and Stand up for justice. Stand up for mercy. And no matter how we look, God, I pray that we will be confident and we trust you. And that, God, when you ask us that question, who are you? What is your name? God, I pray that we have an answer. God, I pray that, that even as we say our name, we say our mistakes, God, I thank you that you're creating a, us new today. That you're changing the way we think. You're making us a new creation so we can go through life knowing who we are and that we can be confident. That we can be confident. In Jesus' name, amen.